Hey there, teachers, friends, uh, school tomorrow. We're doing something different today, a little more experimental. I've always been using Camtasia on this channel. It's a low end, you could say. It's just affordable um, video software for screen capture and editing. But today we're gonna to use Zoom Pro because uh, ICEP.org has set up a new Zoom Pro account and I'm partly just here training myself and how to do this side of the business so let's see i'm going to change my screen share i'm not i'm not a newbie when it comes to zoom right it's like i teach zoom a lot <clears throat> but i usually am piggybacking on someone else's pro account i'm not myself hitting the record button so this is fun so by the way here we are in facebook this is a time when Gerald DeJong, who's the leader in Tensegrity these days, um, because he's got the software to go with it. I've been tracking uh, Gerald since the beginning of his, his uh, adventure. In fact, he flew all the way out here to the West Coast for Java 1, which is a good, you know, historical timeline thing. And then he took the train sort of on a whim to come visit us up here in Seattle, Portland, actually Seattle which is where we had sort of a first synergetics meetup. Yeah, Russell Chu, thank you. That was a great meetup. And Gerald was very shocked at the length of the train line. He was, how long it took, I mean, like he was used to Europe, European scale distance. So, hey, I'll just go from San Francisco to Seattle. How far can it be? It's a long way. It's a lot of hours, right? So he was kind of in shell shock. I remember that. So what am I going to get to in this video? I'm going to finish what I started in the last two. We're going to talk just a tiny bit now, though, about quadrays. Trying to make my move my head around <clears throat> in Zoom here. <clears throat> Resize my head. Yes, very good. And from my outbox, I want to say, picking up on other threads in this channel, we've talked about Ezra Pound quite a bit, haven't we? Um, if you've been tracking, uh, his picture pops up all the time. And here I'm digging down more, like I haven't ever before gone into these uh, early writings from, or letters, correspondence between Ezra Pound and James J. Angleton, right? And Angleton has been a key player here too in connection with, well, the whole Pound era story, right? Hugh Kenner. Hugh Kenner is our bridge to synergetics. He wrote Bucky, uh, Hugh Kenner did, the bio of Buckminster Fuller, a bio, there are lots. And it was a pretty good one, as I recall. Hugh Kenner is totally a polymath. I mean, when he was writing for um, McGraw Hill's Byte magazine, right? I worked at Byte. I mean, I worked at McGraw Hill and I read Byte for free there. And I was always amazed by Hugh Kenner because he was jumping in and out of disciplines. He's like a James Joyce scholar and here he is. He, I think he's the one who got Ractor, one of the early chatbots, to talk to Eliza, right? Oh, Ractor was quite the character. I'm talking about robot personalities, really simple, you know. But the whole idea of having them talk to each other and stuff, that was Hugh Kenner, playful, interesting dude, right? I didn't know him personally. I never met him. But I met Applewhite a lot, and he liked, he liked to think of himself as a Hugh Kenner type. Whatever that was, he wanted to be that. Okay, so part one done. Part two, we're back to the cloud here. We're in Colab. And I'm drilling down to my own repo, but this is a public repo and you can drill down here too. Like what we did um, last week in class, there's a notebook on that, but I polish it before and after class. So it's, you know, how you use your notebooks during your class is not, it's something we talk about on this channel a lot. You're the teacher. I'm like a promulgator of this technology and I'm saying, hey, you can do this, you can do that. But, you know, you can jump in and do something else and you can say, hey, but you can also do this. And, you know, it's not like I have it all figured out is what I'm trying to say. I kind of explore as I go and I share my explorations 
through this high bandwidth, low budget technique, right? And I'm encouraging you to do that too, like emulate. I keep my stuff pretty low budget because I don't want to come out there and wow you all with my million dollar gig. And it's like, oh, well, then I'm just an entertainer and you can sit back. No, it's like, if you're into the Bucky stuff, are you going to do it? Are you going to teach it or something or what? And if you are, <clears throat> let me talk about quad race for a second. There's something called the vector algebra war. Uh, and this is not really part of that war. I would say, like, let's jump to Clifford algebra here. I would say it would be fun if a mathematician who's highly trained would take the quadre concept and maybe do a corresponding Clifford algebra using that instead of a cube, right? So the tri vector would be um, like a tetrahedral wedge in space and so forth. Maybe, maybe I'm blowing smoke. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. I get the feeling a multi vector is just, um, it's like a Gibbsian vector, but it has a lot more bookkeeping going on. It's kind of like Euclidean's extended method, extended Euclidean method, in that by the end of it, you crank through the numbers, you've got so much more like there with you because you use multi vectors instead of simple Gibbsian vectors. But I would say that these are simple Gibbsian vectors, these four vectors from the center of the methane molecule to the corners. They're additive, you scale or multiply. It's all the high school math that you do. It's the vectors you know and love from X, Y, Z with minor modifications. And you can look under the hood, the source code is here, qrays.py, and you can see, you know, how intimately connected they are. And really, I would just say, you could say Q vectors are an API. They're a shell around, <clears throat> they're a way of interacting with Cartesian vectors under the hood. Or Gibbsian vectors, XYZ vectors. This vector algebra history, I was a little bit confused by because it seemed to suggest when I saw it, that Descartes with his coordinates never got off the plane and never had a Z coordinate himself. Is that true? I didn't know that. I was. When we say Cartesian coordinates today, it's the full X, Y, Z, right? Anyway, and, and, and the Gibbsian vector thing, here's my critique. We go through high school, we basically teach it all twice. We teach it as X, Y, Z coordinate. <clears throat> Vectors, it's like, okay, it's X, Y, Z coordinates, learn it all once and then come around the spiral and now it's gonna all be dressed up in vectors. And it's like, why don't we just dress it up in vectors to start with? They're simple enough as mathematical objects that you build, much as you can build a rational number object. And that's what we've been doing in class, actually. I haven't really been harping on uh, this stuff really that much. But I do harp, what I harp on is just getting a super high precision type of number, the GIMPY2 uh, real number in this case, getting that to play getting that to be what's what's up. So here we do all this in floating point. I'm computing, and unfortunately the plane net is missing from the, the presentation here, but I can do some post editing in Camtasia. That's probably what I'll do. Actually, that might dilute the purity of everything. We'll think about it. Um, make my head bigger again. Move, move it around, stuff like this. Now you could join me on this call. You could in the future, like, or I could be a host and not be in the, in the call. It's different ways to configure it. So in now, in higher precision, and this has been our fight in order to get these to work in the cloud for anyone, not just me, you have to install some add-on stuff. And in Google Colab, anyway, it's easy enough. And yes, the A module, <clears throat> one one twenty fourth of a tetrahedron, is accurate out to the last three digits of however much precision we have, right? And I've been changing that precision interactively. In fact, let's get this whole thing running <clears throat> while I talk a little bit, a little bit more about quadrays. Okay, so I'm in the cloud, I'm in the cloud, so I should be able to just rerun all this stuff. Am I not connected or what? Oh, see, I wasn't, okay. I was kind of using it offline in a clever way. 
So now I'm going to make the menu come back. Okay, we're making progress. Run time, run all. So the warning, again, we've done this. This video is like part three of three or part four of four. Why do I spend so much time on quadrates? That's what I wanted to talk about. It's because it's part of a signature lesson where we wander away from the origin, which is zero, 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 and or zero, four zeros in this particular algebra. We wander away and four of us do that kind of turtle wise. And we do it to the 12 corners of a cube octahedron, okay? In other words, at every turn to play, we have 12 choices. <clears throat> now, what, what if we wanna just stay put, stay where you are? Can that be a choice? I don't see why not. So, but in the, in the current implementation in this notebook, you're always, there's a thing called random walk. It's further down here. I'm just running this notebook to show how even, even you can do this. Like right now without any installation of extra software on your computer, you can get out there in the cloud. All you need is a Colab account. And you've got that if you're a Gmail person, if you're a Google person, if you have Google identity, you should be able to do this, okay? <clears throat> if you want, suggestion, you're in high school, you're figuring it out. So I do the whole business with regular floats, the A module that is, and then I recompute and it's so easy to just put in the higher precision stuff. And you know, that's what's exciting. Now, what again am I trying to prove? You'll have to look, or I suggest you look at some of my other videos, especially where I talk about the concept of dimension in synergetics, because you know, this whole stuff about Angleton and what I was talking about earlier, what's in this actual outbox um, relates to Applewhite, right? Applewhite curates Angleton's papers, they're friends at Yale um, when they're you know, young. And I don't know the whole history. Like, I'm not telling you this, like I'm the biographer of either. I'm just saying, I know enough to know that Applewhite and Angleton had a relationship. They were connected because why? They both work for the same what? Company, right? So-called company. And so Furioso is the name of Angleton's first like poetry mag, or you could say, and this is all before the ugliness of World War II, which put Ezra on the wrong side and has him coming back a uh, war criminal. And, but he's treated better than Assange. He doesn't end up, he ends up for 12 years in St. Elizabeth's, but he's allowed to see people. And it's kind of a nice apartment for him. At least that's what I understand. So I think that Angleton probably saw to it or helped make sure that happened, right? Because he's a good friend. And I'm discovering that by drilling down more into this file, which is, uh, you know, he grew up Angleton in Italy, and that's where Pound was based. And when he got on the wrong side of the war, that's because he's very identifying himself with Italian somehow. Right? I've listened to a few of those broadcasts, and we talk elsewhere in this channel about that whole controversy in the Pound era by Hugh Kenner. You know, the guy started talking outward. Talk, the guy started out talking about. Right, and so we are in the humanities grappling with our history, say our American history, our global history as Americans, our American history as global people, whatever. We are studying all that and, and every so often we kind of reach out and over the bridge from the humanities into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and public policy, like through tensegrity, especially we have like a tensegrity bridge, you could say, or it sounds more brittle, an IVM bridge, which is like an XYZ coordinate system bridge. Except we fill space not with cubes, but with octahedra tetrahedra. We call that the isotropic vector matrix. And this is all I would say on the humanities side because we're reading these poetic guys, right? We're understanding the pound era and how all this came to be, all this thinking. So we're studying our own history as um, scholars of American literature. And to understand it fully, we had to go to Jupyter Notebooks and learn things like literate programming and Python and stuff like that. 
which isn't really that much of a problem. And then if you actually are in a STEM discipline, then maybe you see a connection from say quad rays to a Clifford algebra of the future of some kind. Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Suggestion on my end. But in the meantime, we're just trying to get comfortable with Fuller's meaning of 4D. And that's what I was trying to get across is to connect all this together in your own mind. I suggest finding one of my YouTubes where I talk about the concept of dimension in synergetics namespace, in synergetics, two volume book, Macmillan, late seventies came out, 1970s. So that's the book that, and it's all online. So you can, you can anchor your understanding in multiple ways if this material is of interest, okay? So that's the end of it. The random walk basically has been implemented uh, in high precision in a different notebook. You can quickly look at as I close out. So here we are loading Jupyter Notebooks, or excuse me, I'm loading Jupyter Lab, which contains Jupyter Notebooks. And the one we were just looking at and actually running just now as I was talking in the cloud, here it is going to be locally. And I have two versions. I have a version that assumes like an anaconda context, like the environment is kind of a typical laptop environment and you don't need all this other stuff. You just need to go import Gimpy 2 and it's already there. And so you can do almost everything right out of the box. The other copy is the one we were just running in the cloud and it's all kind of packed out with additional code because getting it set up to do what's needed in the cloud requires kind of bootstrapping in a lot of outside code. But now we're already in and local in this other version and there's the random walk I'm talking about. You're going to one of 12 corners of cube octahedron which are your neighboring spheres in the CCP, the IVM. That's a crystallography. If you're not sure where to look for more info on that lingo, it's all over the place. It's not Bucky's. IBM is a Bucky term, but CCP is not. It's been out there for a long time. So he gets all these links, or I, not he, I, whoever who's running this, you get all these links from your tetrahedron, feed them into the tetrahedron uh, volume computer, and boom, out pops your IBM volume in tetra volumes. And we've got this um, method for doing that. And then I go through the whole thing again, the random walk again, thousand steps using, in this case, high precision real numbers set to 200 bits precision now. Could easily boost that. And I still get a whole number volume, but for tiny, tiny noise, right? And I can boost this out and so that's the signature lesson that gives people a sense of what Fuller meant by isotropic vector matrix. It's kind of like a tour of his vocabulary. Um, and to do it, you kind of want a dark ride where everybody rides in the quadri quad pod, right? Let's end with that. This thing by Hop, a fun, fun little graphic that I also include in the slideshow, right? It's a little animated graphic that helps you understand how could I move around in space with only four rockets? You know, you wanna go in every direction. So you wanna distribute those as um, economically as possible. So you have the most possibilities. <clears throat> and the idea is um, a, a linear combination, a, a, diff a differential amount of thrust through any combination of these quad pods would get you to go in any direction. And that's kind of a mathematical sense that that's true. Like in practice, I wouldn't say this is super efficient to build your rocket like that maybe, but you see the idea, right? With a linear combination, meaning a scalar amount of thrust through each uh, push, uh, you can send yourself in any direction. And that's kind of alternative to the more X, Y, Z rectilinear way of, of propulsion, right? So it's a, an alternative spaceship. If you wanna call it a UFO, you may, because, hey, <clears throat> I don't know what it is. I mean, how big is it? I couldn't tell you. Are there people in there? Have they been abducted? Are there cows? 
anyway, I think this is a, a good stopping place. I think we understand that American history is now looking back through a longer, like, like a longer toilet paper tube or a paper towel tube or, you know, a long tunnel. And as we go into the future, the tunnel gets longer and more and more comes into view about what's been happening. And now we're coming to where we can see more clearly what's been going on in, you could say, um, Hugh Kenner's world, the literary world in American history and so on. So it's all just coming into better focus and enjoy, enjoy teaching it. That's what I wanna do is get more teachers ready to roll. You're already employed, you're already in your school, you already have a free hand as a literature teacher to teach literature, math. Like I was saying in another video, your hands are tied, I'm sorry. They are very strict over there. But if you just wanna teach American literature, this is literature. It's all written in prose, synergetics, those two volumes. And I'm talking about a Haken's um, book, Spring of Verloc. That's different. It's not a style of synergetics, which aims to be a bridge over the CP snow chasm between the humanities and STEM or sciences. He wants to use prose so that we, the humanities people, feel confident in, you know, going over there for a visit sometimes. Tourists for tourists. All right, talk to y'all later. Have a fun afternoon and week. And I'll figure out how to end this recording. I keep forgetting I'm not in Camtasia. I'm in Zoom. All right. So here we go, end, and then I will stop the recording. It's not that hot here in Portland today. We've just been through a second heat wave. And in another video, I will show you a Washington Post article where. Um, some of my friends are interviewed and mentioned. Okay, talk to you later.